I didn't know this until yesterday and I found it fascinating, but did you know that men's bodies are traditionally used for medical research under the assumption that women are just smaller versions of men? I feel this, like that with you this... all the time, don't I? Just a smaller <laughs> version of Alan Hughes. It's my life, it's what I want. Oh dear God. <laughs> <laughs> the poor fella is like, Tommy, come back from holidays, I can't be dealing with her anymore. Uh, joining us is Dr. Hazel Wallace, whose new book, The Female Factor, sheds light on how gender bias in medicine is actually putting women's <coughs> health at risk. It is a pleasure to have you here, Hazel. Thank Good you morning to you. It's Good so morning. lovely. You're doing so much in this, in this sphere, but you kind of really got into this world where you're a doctor and you saw an awful lot of things about a decade ago online in the health vlogging sphere that you were like that's medically not wrong and you kind of moved in there to kind of bust some myths yeah yeah so i i started on instagram 10 years ago which seems like a lifetime ago and i had just started i'd come into my second degree which was medicine and i was really interested in my own health and fitness and i realized there was like lots of bloggers online giving out health information but it wasn't wholly accurate so i was like well i might as well use my own scientific backing here to help translate some of this so it started as more of a nutrition blog a lot of myth busting and over the years i guess as i qualified and started working as a doctor myself it, I moved into other aspects of like lifestyle medicine let's just say like fitness and health and more things that we can do in our daily lives and I guess how I stumbled into writing the female factor was as a woman myself and also as a doctor to many women I realized that we were almost treating women differently in the hospital and the research that we were, we were using was very archaic and based on male bodies male mice male cells and it meant that women were being underdiagnosed misdiagnosed undertreated and felt like they weren't being listened to. So that's Did how the book... Did you even say male mice? Male mice. Yeah. So yeah. they, they can't even them. bother? No. So in, in like eight out of 10 areas of biology, there's a male bias when they use male mice. That's so they'll, right. yeah. Because we were talking about this yesterday at the meeting and we were just going, what? And it's like, so medical research very much biased towards men for the research. But I mean, that obviously, as you're saying, would have knock-on effects. Absolutely. But the assumption was women are just smaller men. Like, it's fine. We'll just, you know, give them half the dose. Or... You're a lovely small man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, it blows my mind. And I mean, the reason that women have been historically excluded is because they have fluctuating hormones, which were considered a nuisance by scientists because it will change, you know, it's something they need to factor in. And also there's the risk of pregnancy. So if it came to drug trials, they can't include women or at the time they thought it wasn't ethically correct. So all these factors mean they just completely excluded women. But yes, we do have those fluctuating hormones and that actually will dictate our mood, our gut health, our brain health, our heart health but they just haven't been considered. They couldn't even be bothered making a female dummy for when they were testing seatbelts, like, like as to how, so there's so many more chest injuries and, and issues like that. So this is at a very basic level because women ingest drugs in a different way to men. So traditionally, have we been, like we'll get into like the amount of scandals in relation to women's health in this country mm. is unbelievable. Across the world. Across the world, absolutely. You know, we just what we think here. But we ingest drugs differently, right? Yeah, so women, again, we, we, we just assume they're slightly smaller and may need a smaller dose. But when, when, when it comes to absorbing a drug, you ingest it, and then how quickly that absorbed is based on a, a number of factors. So women tend to have more body fat. We have smaller livers, so it reduces the time it, or it increases the time it takes to process the drug. And also we've got like a slower gut transit time. So again, it reduces the time it takes to absorb that. And so all of these factors and also our kidneys, when we metabolize the drug, that's also slower. All of these things mean that we're going to be more susceptible to having an adverse reaction. And actually women are twice as likely than men are to have an adverse reaction to a drug. And as a result, lots of drugs have been withdrawn from the market over the last couple of years. But Hazel, like say prescribed drugs and you go to your doctor and they prescribe you something. It just says adults. It doesn't say men take this, women take this. It said adult take two a day or six a day, whatever. Yeah. So you're saying like the men will absorb that differently to a woman? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, over in future years that may change and we'll have different, you know, drug doses for men and women. 
as we do for adults and kids because we are different. We have to consider those, those differences in terms of how we metabolise them. But I suppose when you think about women of childbearing age, mm -hmm. I suppose, they haven't been recruited into studies because there's the worry that you could get pregnant. So what's the answer? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's difficult, but in, in terms of testing women of childbearing age, you would have to do it with a kind of a form of contraception. There's lots of ethics involved. But if you don't check, then you'll never know. Yeah. And so we can't just blanket assume that a woman is going to respond the same way because a reaction to a drug can just be an allergy or you might feel unwell, but it could be fatal. It could be life threatening. So it's not something we should take lightly. Like in research then, like, is, is continuing. Is it changing? Uh, people obviously know that at this stage that we need to do more research on women. Like, is it like men are mo more likely to survive a heart attack than women? Yeah. Like, has that been researched? It's only been researched in recent years. And now, I mean, in research, you have to include women or if it's appropriate to do so and it's relevant. But by the time research comes out and guidelines go into place and it's actually implemented into medical practice, it's years and years and years. And so when it comes to heart disease, there's a big assumption that it's just a man's disease. And like, if you think of any TV advert for a heart attack, it'll be an older man clutching his chest. Mm. But women are just as likely to die from a heart attack. And actually in the UK, they're twice as likely to die from a heart attack than a man is, purely because of the care that they receive, because they, if a woman experiences symptoms of a heart attack, she will assume it's something else. She's more likely to put off going to hospital or try self-medicate at home. And when she gets to hospital, she's 1.5 times more likely to be misdiagnosed with something else. Misdiagnosed? Yes. With something like palpitations or because as a result of anxiety. But it presents differently. It, does it, it does, or is it just because we don't associate it with women? So women are more likely to experience um, slightly different symptoms um, like pain between the shoulder blades and nausea, but chest pain is the overarching okay. feeling. And if you do, to any woman listening, if you ever have chest pain that is intense and it's um, in the center of your chest and it doesn't go away after 15 minutes, don't ignore that. Don't just assume it's a yeah. little bit of anxiety or heartburn, get checked out. So it's raising awareness because women don't assume that they're going to have that. It's the biases we hold about men and women. And it's so frustrating wow. over these years. I know we're paying atten attention to things like PCO, polycystic ovarian syndrome these days, where it was something that was ignored before. It was just get on with it, you've got a bad period. Yeah. And friends who go these days, it, just the research isn't there. And mm. it's the frustration at centuries of just yeah. being ignored. But when it does come, because you're known as a food medic, you know, you, you're a doctor, you're also a nutritionist. It, is that linked with women uh, a lot, the nutrition that women take in? Does it have a lot to do with our health and it's different from men? Yeah, absolutely. I think we consider women's nutrition only when she's pregnant okay. <laughs> or when she's postnatal. But not all women will get pregnant or want to do that. And actually, a woman's nutrition is important across the lifespan. Like, you know, when you go through puberty, iron's more important. If you're trying to conceive, folic acid. After the menopause, you need to think about your heart health, your bone health. There's even nutrition that can help with menopausal symptoms, like hot flashes. So there's all these things that were not, that isn't, you know, readily available to a woman. And even across the menstrual cycle, you'll have different nutritional requirements. And this often will manifest as cravings, which as women were told to ignore, have a glass of water, go for a walk, pretend it never happened. When actually, if we helped support women around those times with the right nutritional advice, they would probably have a more seamless transition through their cycle. So like say when we're th those times when it's like, I, you just want a chocolate bar, you know what I mean? You yeah. want a chocolate bar. I know in the book that you talk about things like this and you're like, oh, and like, I just go for it. But a lot of people will deny they, they should be supported. Obviously, your body is craving something. It needs calories. Yeah. So just before your period in that premenstrual phase, which is the luteal phase, yeah. women burn more calories at rest. So 300 calories on average. It's very variable from woman to woman. But that means your metabolism is higher. So then you're going to be burning more energy. So you need more energy. So your body will respond by craving food. And if you're telling it, no, restrict, restrict, just drink water, you'll end up either you know, feeling very lethargic or then binging on food later in the night. So what I say to women is make sure you're getting in lots of complex carbohydrates, get in high energy food, listen to your body. Don't feel like you need to restrict because your body's working hard.
to, to, yeah. yeah, and my husband craves chocolate all the time. What does that say about him? <laughs> 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 Literally. <laughs> I mean, I don't... <laughs> Mary, do you want to have to know about you? It's fine. That's what he needs. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the female factor. Yes. So you have decided, you've done proper research, you've done this, and it's you're looking at women. You're just like, gals, yeah, there's I was a reason like, for this. There's no book out there, and I mean... I, it started as a very activist book because I was very frustrated and I sat back and thought, actually, I want this to be a really practical manual so that when women open it, they're like, OK, I understand how I'm different, but how can I implement that? How can I sleep better? How, what should I eat across the menstrual cycle? How can I exercise when I'm in the menopause? All of those things or like, why do I feel, you know, why is my mood different at certain times of my cycle? So I dress all of those things in the book. And you can kind of go look at it and you're like, okay, that's there. Yeah. It's for, you can find it. Mary, be go. straight in for the how do you, know. you sleep better? <laughs> yeah. How do you sleep better? <laughs> Why, what in. should I be eating at the like in all fair, it's it's just a minefield. It's it a minefield mind of everything. Field. Yeah. And it's yeah. amazing to kind of that people talk about it now. It is really amazing. Uh, Dr. Hazel Wallace, the food medic, and the book is called The Female Factor. Uh, you can get it now. Congratulations on the book. It's fantastic. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much. Thank Thanks you so much, in. Hazel. Cheers. Thank you.